Streaming and machine learning used together is incredibly complex. Using the right tool set can simplify it so you can get to value quickly. I'm Abhi Suryachi, and I work as a solutions architect at Databricks. I love my work because I get to work with machine learning engineers and data scientists and organizations across the United States to solve business problems with machine learning. Now, speaking of Databricks, we are the inventor and pioneer of the Data Lake House, a topic which I'll come back to. We have strong roots in open source with Apache Spark, MLflow, and Delta Lake all coming from Databricks. Currently, we are well over 4,000 employees strong and are growing up rapidly. Now, during the course of this talk, I'm going to mention the term lake house a lot. It's actually central to the topic and not just a buzzword. So it's important to describe what it is before I dive into streaming and machine learning. So the Databricks lake house platform is unique in three ways. One, it's simple. Data only needs to exist once to support all of your data workloads on a single common platform. Two, it's open. It's based on open source and open standards to make it easy to work with existing tools and avoid proprietary formats. Three, it's collaborative. Data engineers, analysts, data scientists, and machine learning engineers are able to work together much more easily without any artificial silos. These three properties of the lake house makes it an ideal tool for solving data and machine learning problems in the simplest way possible. Now let me tell you a story. Right after grad school, I worked on a startup that built a natural language querying tool for analyzing social media data. It was fairly simple, as you can see here, a simple UI and a service in the back end integrating user input with natural language processing and returning the analysis to the end user. But one of the problems I had was how do I distinguish between users and bots based on clicks? These clicks would be continuously generated and the process of distinguishing between bots and real users would need to be done using an automated process in a cost-effective manner. Now for a solo startup founder in an incubator in Iowa coding away, this was too much of a challenge to handle. So I put it on the back burner and focused on more important things to keep the business afloat. No surprises, I never got back to it. This problem is not unique to my past self. Now imagine you're a developer at an e-commerce company. You have the same problem. Instead of sellers and buyers, you'd have some bot-generated clicks too, and you want to detect the bots. You need a way to automatically detect bots in your continuously generated clickstream data. So a solution that uses machine learning to detect these anomalous users or outliers in a stream of data would be ideal for this. To come up with a solution for this, we need to take a look at a couple of things. First of those is streaming. The definition of streaming data is data that is continuous and unbounded. There are a large number of streaming data sources, change data feeds from databases, click stream data from websites like the one we're talking about, machine and application logs, application events, and mobile and IoT data. As a matter of fact, most of the world's data is streaming data, and your organization probably has lots of it. Now let's go a little deeper. Stream processing is different from the traditional definition of processing. Traditional processing loads the data into a storage location to create an artificial boundary, and then processes the bounded data in a one-off manner. So this is a two-step process. Now, on the other hand, stream processing is continuous and unbounded. Just to be clear, Apache Spark does a whole lot more than just data processing, but processing data in batch or in stream is a core part of what it does really well. Another key aspect of Apache Spark is that it has a consistent API for both batch and stream processing, whether you're using SQL or Python. A lot of key constructs in traditional batch processing are carried over to Apache Spark structured streaming. Instead of processing data in a single batch, data is processed in a series of micro batches. As you can see in the diagram, you could think of the data stream as an unbounded table. New data in the data stream is equal to new rows appended to this unbounded table. Many people associate streaming with low latency processing, but this doesn't necessarily have to be the case all the time. For example, you can use structured streaming to perform incremental processing periodically, for example, daily or hourly. We can go as far as stating that batch is just a special case of streaming, if you look at a long enough time horizon. Writing the syntax for the transformations in a streaming pipeline is one thing. Putting it in production in a reliable and scalable manner is a whole new ball game. There's a lot of complexity in production scenarios to the point that data engineers spend a lot of their time on tooling instead of getting value from data. One framework that simplifies this process significantly is Delta Live Tables, or DLT. DLT uses a simple declarative approach to building reliable data pipelines, streaming, or batch, whether using Python or SQL. The underlying DLT engine figures out dependencies live, monitors data quality, and automate away literally all the operational com complexity. Additionally, you can treat your data as code and apply modern software engineering best practices like testing, error handling, monitoring, and documentation to deploy these pipelines at scale. Now let's talk a little bit about machine learning. In a nutshell, machine learning involves extracting patterns from data and using those patterns to make predictions on new data. Now, there are a number of caveats and nuances to this, but at a high level, this is accurate. 
It's also important to dig a little deeper and understand the machine learning life cycle. Imagine you're a data scientist at this e-commerce company. You start with the data, you receive data from an upstream process, likely a data pipeline. Then you do some exploratory data analysis and perform feature engineering to mold this data into a form that a machine learning algorithm can be trained on and also infuse domain knowledge into these inputs. Then you perform model selection. The idea here is simple. You need to pick the best machine learning pipeline for the predictive task at hand from a space of different feature engineering approaches, multiple algorithm types, and hyperparameter combinations for each of those algorithms. Then you validate the models on a number of criteria such as business requirements and regulatory requirements and fairness and bias, which are undeniably important steps in the process. Finally, you put this trained machine learning model in production, in stream, real time, or batch. After a while, the model performance degrades and you have to rerun the whole process end to end all over again. And this process is usually automated with some intervention from humans at key stages. Again, there are a number of caveats and nuances to this, but at a high level, this is a commonly seen pattern for most use cases in production. Now, there are many platforms to do machine learning. I know Databricks pretty well, I work here, and I can think of a number of reasons to go with Databricks for your machine learning workloads. Let's start with the data. Machine learning is a data-centric process, garbage in, garbage out. So ensuring the quality of your data that you feed into machine learning training processes is imperative. Storing data in Delta is key to ensuring this. Delta tables are basically data stored in Parquet, which is an open source format co-located with a JSON transaction lock that sits in cheap object storage in the cloud. These two things together allow acid transactions and ensure data quality with the cost benefits of using object storage. In addition to this, on Databricks, you have a feature store that leverages Delta under the hood to ensure discoverability and reuse of features. The lake house caters to both professional data scientists and citizen data scientists. AutoML plays a key role here, and we'll dig into this a little bit deeper in a minute. MLflow, an open source MLOps framework that we created, is tightly integrated with the platform so that every machine learning experiment parameter, metric, and model is tracked and logged, making the entire process reproducible and easy to put models into production. The process of logging the model with MLflow automatically creates a user-defined function, or a UDF, which encapsulates the inference logic, whether you want to deploy the model as a service, in-stream, or for batch inference. And this reduces the developer overhead significantly. Now let's take a closer look at the whole idea of automating machine learning. AutoML has played a significant role in making machine learning accessible to more people than it used to before. Given some training data, you could automatically generate a dependable baseline model that could be modified by a data scientist and put in production but not all automated machine learning frameworks provide the end user with human-readable, annotated code that can be modified. One AutoML tool that does so is Databricks AutoML. Databricks AutoML provides a glass box solution to AutoML. It provides the benefits of automation while giving the end user full ownership of code and models. You can run AutoML from the UI or the API. AutoML will test different models, tune hyperparameters, and return the list of models produced. There are three important aspects to consider. First, it's tightly integrated with MLflow. All the models trained and corresponding metadata are neatly organized into an experiment. A data exploration notebook is returned. And finally, a reproducible trial notebooks can be edited as desired to customize the model. With all models automatically logged to MLflow, it's easy to deploy an AutoML model for batch, streaming, or online inference via the model registry. Now, why would you want to combine both streaming and machine learning together? First of all, there are a number of applications, such as clickstream anomaly detection, that is low latency in nature. While streaming is not only for low latency applications, it's definitely a preferred mode of processing for data from these sources. As we saw before, there's an explosion in streaming data sources, especially for many businesses opting to have an online presence with smart smartphone usage through the roof and sensors in a variety of contexts from retail to industrial IoT to healthcare. Then with Delta Live Tables, we saw that there are easier ways of creating production grade streaming pipelines and there are improved glass box RML frameworks like the one we looked into on the Databricks Lake House. Also, if done right, using the right tool set, streaming machine learning inference is likely going to be cheaper and more performant than deploying the models as resting points for a number of use cases. Now let's put everything we discussed together. We'll walk through the steps of building out the streaming machine learning inference pipeline for anomaly detection in clickstream data originating from our friend's e-commerce website. In the Databricks Lake House, we have an incremental ingestion mechanism called the autoloader. As clickstream records land in object storage, the autoloader processes this data and writes it to a delta table incrementally. We call this table a bronze table, which is essentially a table with raw data to which a schema is applied. Then you perform some transformations on this data to get to a silver delta table. 
When you perform further aggregations, you land this delta data in a gold delta table. The series of delta tables is what we call the medallion architecture in the lake house. Let's assume that our developer has access to some label training data. Then you can use Databricks AutoML to obtain a classification model that can predict which is which bots versus real users. Since the model is logged with MLflow automatically, you get the user-defined function or the UDF inference code as a result. You can register this UDF and use it in the pipeline, just like using any other Python or SQL function. This entire pipeline of transformations written in SQL or Python can be deployed as a Delta Live Tables pipeline. Selecting the continuous mode for running this pipeline ensures that the data transformation and model inference is run as a streaming process. And of course, infrastructure management, data quality, monitoring, and all the other operational details are abstracted from the end user and automatically handled by Delta Live Tables, as we discussed. You can also use Databricks SQL, a tool within Databricks primarily catering to SQL analysts to query the goal table with the inferred records and build dashboards that constantly update as the clickstream is processed. You can see the DLT pipeline created on the top left here. The DAG is inferred from the transformation logic and automatically created by the DLT engine. The continuously updated dashboard monitoring anomalies built with Databricks SQL is on the bottom right. When you work on a project like this, it's highly unlikely that you would do it alone. So when you are working as a group, adopting best practices for data science and engineering code development is critical. To help with this, Repos in Databricks is a feature that allows you to have repository level Git integration with Git providers like GitHub, or GitHub Enterprise Server and others. You can develop code in a Databricks notebook, sync it with a remote Git repository, and use Git commands for updates and source control. Here, we clone a remote Git repository with the code for the DLT pipelines in a couple of clicks. So you can edit the notebooks and sync it with the remote Git repo. We can use these notebooks in repos to create a DLT pipeline that could be tested and put in production. Now, what if you have to change some aspect of this DLT pipeline that you put in production? Let's say you want to deploy a different, more optimized model in the stream. For example, an isolation forest model that has been trained on a large volume of data that performs better than our AutoML model. Now we move into the realm of CI-CD. I don't know about you, but when I think of CI-CD and GitHub, I think of GitHub Actions. If you're unfamiliar with GitHub Actions, you could think of them as tasks or units of automation that are triggered in response to certain actions that occur in a GitHub repository. There's a whole marketplace of these actions, and there are a couple from Databricks themselves. We use one of them for our example. GitHub Actions uses YAML files to define what steps to take in the Git workflow. The first couple of lines here describe the trigger for these GitHub Actions. So according to this, any action we describe in this file will only trigger on the event of a pull request. In short, here we check out the development branch and run a set of unit tests in this test notebook with the help of the Databricks run notebook GitHub Action. This is run in the Databricks compute cluster we've specified in the YAML file, as you can see here. Let's say you have this trained isolation forest model and want to introduce that to the pipeline. You have to change the corresponding cell in the notebook. Then you make a pull request. This pull request triggers the GitHub action to run all the unit tests. As you can see here, once the tests are run and all the checks pass and everything is good to go, you can merge the pull request and delete the branch. Now let's zoom out. We've tried different model approaches, AutoML models or isolation force models. Then we go through the process of model selection as we talked about before. Since all of these models are logged, you can basically copy and paste the UDF code from the UI in the notebook where we register the UDF. This notebook will be the one that constitutes the DLT pipeline. Once we create a pull request, this regress a Git workflow where it checks out a branch and a job where a notebook with unit tests validates the model. You can merge and have the DLT notebook pick up the code changes with new ML inference logic. If the tests fail, you can look at the job execution details in Databricks to see what went wrong because you have full visibility into that. This is not limited to this anomaly detection problem or clickstream data. You can also perform sentiment analysis on social media feeds using the same architecture. The data passing through the pipeline would be text, which Delta supports, and the model will be a sentiment classification model. You could use a sentiment classification pipeline from the Hugging Face Transformers library and log it with the MLflow to obtain the UDF. You can even go further with this and do brand-specific priority analysis on the social media feed. Here, you would provide the desired classes to classify on to the zero shot classification pipeline from Hugging Face and run the streaming pipeline with DLT. In either case, you can use the model pipeline out of the box with zero training. I encourage you to apply this to a challenge that exists within your organization that could be solved using stream processing and in-stream machine learning inference. The links here will help you with the finer points of implementing this. Thank you so much. I'm Avi, and I hope you have a great GitHub Universe 2022.